Just Fork is a really common solution to basically any problem that exists in the FOSS world. Your audio editor adds in telemetry. We'll just fork it. Your favorite web browser decides to move around their layout and the layout is an absolute mess. We'll just fork it. Uh, your file manager changes the background color of the window. We'll just fork it. And I love that this is an option that does exist. I would never want to get rid of this option and only use proprietary applications. I used to do that, and if a change was made, well, I basically just had to live with it. This is an amazing option that we do have, but sometimes forking an application isn't the best option. Sure, making a fork is very easy. If you're on GitHub, there's even a button for it, you can just click on that, and wow, it's magically made a fork for you. But that's not really a fork. What you've done is you've copied the source code into a different repo. Actually making a fork and properly maintaining it and making it an actual application is a much, much harder ordeal. And if the goal of your fork is to be replacing the main application in the case of, say, Audacity, where they start going down a really crazy route, well, that's actually incredibly difficult. I would never want to discourage anyone who wants to properly fork an application, but do keep in mind that it is going to be a lot of work. Saying just fork it is easy. Actually forking an application, though, is much, much harder. Let's say, for example, you don't like the direction that Firefox is going, but the developers think that what they're doing is the best. And no matter how much you try to, like, contact them, post issues, things like that, try to actually get them to change to a different direction, they don't want to do it. At that stage, there's not really much else you can do besides forking the application. Well, now you forked it. Now you have to maintain it. Now you no longer have the support of the massive development team. A code base like this is not intended for a single person. Let's say you were even a developer on the original project and you know your way around the code base enough to know where you'd need to go to add new features you want to add. In the case of a web browser, unless you're developing this with a team, you probably don't want to do a hard fork because you probably want to keep pulling in the security patches because running an unpatched browser is going to be incredibly dangerous. So you'll be pulling in those changes from upstream while you're making your own changes. This is going to lead to some merge conflicts. So you're going to have to be scanning over the patches that come in for the original browser, working out the patches you want to pull in, dealing with those merge conflicts, trying to have time to actually work on your own features, and all of this together, I feel like for most regular people, is going to be way, way too much work. So as time goes on, if you don't get extra contributors, the project is going to fall further and further out of date with the upstream branch. For any really large projects like that, you're just basically going to have to accept that it will always have security vulnerabilities and will always be out of date. That might be fine for what you're doing. Maybe security doesn't really matter for what you're doing. Maybe it's, say, a terminal file manager or a terminal or, um, I don't know, a video recorder, things like that. In that case, it's probably not that big of a deal. But where security is important, it is going to be a problem. There is one situation where that doesn't become a problem. Let's say the repo you forked from is a dead project. Let's say the maintainer just disappeared off the face of the planet and isn't actually accepting any more pull requests. Well, in that case, there's nothing to be pulling in from upstream and you can effectively treat this as if it's your own project that doesn't have anything else to worry about. Now, maybe it's not just your problem, maybe a bunch of people in the community all have a problem with this project and the direction it's going. For example, take the Audacity situation. So, this is going to have a benefit. This is going to lead to more manpower actually being willing to work on a project, and if everyone actually works together, there can be a good fork that does exist from this. But there's a problem. When a project exists as a single unit, all of the developers are working in one place. But when a project forks from a situation like this, rarely does it fork into one singular project where everyone just moves from the main project to this other project. When something like this forks, usually there's going to be a bunch of different directions that goes in at the same time, splitting up labor to all of these different projects. And maybe some of these forks even have the exact same goal, but they don't know about each other, or maybe the maintainers don't like each other, and it just creates this massive, massive mess. The best result that can come from this is when the similarly minded developers decide on one fork to work on and then all work together. That is the 
best result you can get. What will usually happen, though, is a bunch of forks will happen at the same time. This is what's happened with Audacity, and only a couple of the forks actually keep getting maintained. So right now, there is Sneedacity and Tenacity, and all of the others that existed are just basically dead. There is Dark Audacity, but that existed way before this whole situation, so I'm not going to count it for now. These are the main two that exist. For a small project, reputation and marketing don't really matter. If you fork a terminal, it doesn't really matter if anyone else even knows that fork actually exists. But if you're forking something like, say, a web browser, let's say Firefox, or you're forking... I don't know, a video editor like Caden Live, or you're forking an audio editor like Audacity. Projects like this, you want people to actually know about. And it takes a very long time for the original projects to actually build up reputation and have people actually know about them, let alone a fork that just came out of nowhere and just started yesterday. I'm not including Freenode and Libera Chat because usually that's not how it goes down. Usually a project doesn't light itself on fire and then its competitor takes all of its users. Think instead about OpenOffice and LibreOffice. At this point, no one really ever talks about OpenOffice, but it wasn't always like that. At one point, OpenOffice was the main application, and then LibreOffice forked from that, and over time, the LibreOffice project has built up a reputation that's made that the main application. Or if you want a gaming example, there was a FOSS game called Nexus, and a couple of the devs didn't like the direction it was going, it eventually made its way onto Steam and now has a price tag attached to it and nobody plays it, but this group of developers decided we're going to go and take Nexus and take it in a better direction, and that's how we got Xenotic. And because of this, they had a lot of trouble getting a Wikipedia page in the past, because to Wikipedia, it was unclear on whether Xenotic was actually a whole separate project. Since then, they actually did get one, and it's all good now. And I expect the exact same thing to happen when the Audacity forks actually get enough traction to maybe want one of these pages. Obviously, that's not a concern to every project out there, but it is something to keep in mind for the much larger forks. None of that's to say that forking a project is just not a good thing to do ever. Those were intentionally extreme examples to show that yes, some projects, forking them is going to be a very, very serious problem. But sometimes, forking an application can actually be incredibly easy. Most projects out there aren't web browsers or video editors or audio editors or video recorders or desktop environments or distros even. Most projects out there are far, far more manageable. Most things out there are things like a couple hundred line Python script, a couple thousand lines of Rust code, maybe a simple bash script, maybe a hundred lines of Go code. All of that stuff is perfectly manageable for a single person. And maybe your goal is to fix some personal pet peeve. You don't really care if anyone else actually uses it. All you care is this problem doesn't exist in your life anymore. Forking the application is a perfectly fine thing to do, and I fully encourage you to actually do so. And likewise, this doesn't mean that if you're just an individual, you shouldn't go and fork a big project. If you want to go and do that, that's cool. Go spend your entire life working on nothing but Firefox, never seeing the light of day. I'm not going to do that, but if you want to, it's your life. But there are other paths available before you decide to fork an application that might get your problem fixed. Have you tried submitting an issue and seeing if the dev is willing to fix it? Have you tried submitting an issue and actually fixing the problem yourself? I've noticed with some projects out there, the dev is willing to accept a new feature request, but because they don't consider it to be high priority for themselves, they just won't bother to actually do it. But they're more than willing to accept someone else doing it if they want to go and put that time in. Or maybe even trying a different application and seeing if it better fits your workflow. If you haven't at least tried these things, I don't think you should be forking an application. All of these things will take far, far less time than going and maintaining a fork. But if you have and you want to go and spend that time, then be my guest, go make a cool application and show the original developers what you can actually do. That'll be it for me, and before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim Donald, Logan Michael, Andrew Mitchell, Nathan, David Carl Will, Brennan, Chica Bento, Jamie Joseph Josh, Michael, Peter D. Stephen Tees through Tony Tushar, and all of my two dollar supporters. If you would like to support more work, the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe star, leave a pair, all that sort of stuff, I've got my podcast. 
Tech Over T available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays where I live stream twice a week and upload about five or so YouTube shorts. And this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That's it for me and I'm out.